looking for a pot of gold Going up and down like a merry-go-round Got to know what I'll find I will find my only goal Where the road leads, I don't know. Greetings in podcast land. Today's guest is none other than blues legend Michael Charles. Oh, you, you actually had a gig booked at Birds, did you? Or? At Birds again, yeah. Oh, wow. There you go. That would have been terrific. Yes, it would have. I'm, uh, I'm supposed to be in Canada right now, so that was all. I was supposed to be in Canada this whole month, and uh, that got... Uh, shifted as well so it's just been bad for everybody all around it has and um that was actually what i was going to ask you was uh, how how have you de- how have you been dealing with the covert and what's been happening with your 2020 uh tour the whole tour thing I had the whole year booked out I had a really um busy high-end schedule but um when covid kicked in obviously everything had to shut down and um, big disappointment for, you know, for me and also my crew, you know, the, uh, the band, the, the, the road crew. Everybody's just like, wow, what's going on? you just got to learn to cope with it, I guess. It's just it hasn't been easy. Um, but you've got to deal with it or else you're going to go totally insane, right? <laughs> yeah, some, <laughs> <laughs> I think something like that, yeah. Yeah, the pieces are starting starting to drop off. That's for sure. I think I think it's here to stay. It's just going to be um, just like the flu. I mean, the flu is is it's here to stay. It's never it, it came and never disappeared. And we just with time, hopefully, hopefully there'll be a vaccine. And and uh, I think it's just going to become a part of life. And um, I hope I'm wrong. I hate being wrong, but I hope I'm wrong this time. But I think it's here to stay. Yeah. Um, I was one of the fortunate ones because um, having my own recording studio and everything, so I've kind of locked myself away in my studio and and do what I need to do musically. And um, But I don't know what it would be like if I didn't have my studio. Um, I think I'd be totally insane by now. <laughs> 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 I think some people are going down that path, mate. So you did grow up in Coburg. You know, I live in Coburg myself, actually. Oh, wow. Well, whereabouts in Coburg? I live in Phillip Street. Phillip Street. That sounds familiar. Which It's is, been a long time. I've been away from there for... <laughs> ooh. <laughs> uh, I've been living in the States for 30, for 30 years. Mm. And uh, I, I believe I was about four. T- oh no, I was younger than that. I was about twelve years old, mm. I believe, when my dad built a new home out in Faulkner. And uh, so I haven't been in, uh, out of touch with Coburg since I've been about, let's say, fourteen, thirteen years old. So yeah, I, I guess it's changed a lot. I went back there to the house I grew up as a kid when we were doing the documentary, and. Uh, that's as close as I ever got since I left there. Okay. What street was that? I was in Linda Street. Oh, yeah. Well, you're not far from Phillip Street, which is just off uh, that's right. Reynard Street. That's yeah. why I'm saying that yeah. uh, that street sounded familiar. I said, yeah. wow, that sounds familiar. I probably rode up and down that street on my bicycle You probably as a kid. You probably did, mate. <laughs> and uh, it's basically around the corner from St. Fidel's. That's where I live. I, oh, I can hear the same, church. I can, same for, yeah, for Dallas. Yeah, for Dallas. Well, I went to that school as a uh, – but the, I got expelled, believe it or not. I was just a little kid, I think grade grade two or grade three. The nuns hit me on – I don't know if you've seen my documentary. I did, or not, I did. But the nuns hit me on, uh, on, my, on my knuckles with a ruler, and it was a really cold day. So I kind of said something I shouldn't have said, and they called my parents up and said they didn't want me in that school anymore. I wasn't – I wasn't Catholic enough, I guess. You weren't suitable. That's all right. I, got, I wasn't suitable, man. I, I, so I wasn't I, su- So they threw me out. I wasn't suitable either. I got thrown out of three uh, secondary schools, so um, I can relate to that in some way. Well, yeah, I got I got tossed out of that as, as a toddler, basically. Then I went to, um, actually before moving to Faulkner, 
they sent me to uh, Coburg State School or something. I think it was Coburg State School and uh, a long time ago. And I got expelled from there too. And then I got expelled again in Faulkner. So I did have a good run at school. I, was, I never really liked school. All I wanted to do was play guitar. Mm. Well, that's it. At least you knew what you wanted to do, you know. Um, I wanted to play music uh, and I sort of started playing a little bit, but I was just the lost soul, you know, out in the western suburbs uh, and being expelled. It was a very lonely time because it was it was more frustration with me because going to, going to school for me was more <laughs> like um, – they weren't really teaching me anything because I went to a really tough technical school out in Altona North and uh, it wasn't the environment where you could be studious at your work or anything like that because there was a lot of disruption in the classroom all the time and all that sort of stuff, you know. And um, so you had to find your way through all of that craziness, you know, and um, amongst that you get a little bit frustrated because you just know you're not getting the real – essence of education you're not learning anything and that used to frustrate the hell out of me you know and uh hence i used to rebel against that and uh get quite frustrated and then uh then the uh you know the yellow paper came in the report card you know seek employment when you hit 15 and then you sort of go off to the meatworks line up at the front of gilbinson's and uh, or don smorgan's and uh wait for uh some guy to come out and pick you out and go yeah you have a day's work you know that's what it was like back then i never went because i just couldn't work in the meatworks but uh all the guys who got thrown out with me were down at gilbinson's at the age of 15 you know um so that was sort of the pathway so you you were touring in the 70s is that right you were- Yes, I was. I was. Um, uh, I started playing around the traps as, as, as a very young kid, and um, but by the seventies, um, I already formed my first band. It was named actually was named uh, Black Venom. What a silly name, but that's what it was called. And um, it was it, it was the time, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, it was the Times, yeah. <laughs> Black Venom, what a name. And uh, so I had that band for a few years and we were playing, you know, local local gigs and things like that. We were just school kids. And um, I remember my dad, because my dad taught me guitar originally. I remember my dad saying, I can see this is what you want to do and I can see that everything else is not important to you. So if you're going to do it, do it right. So he, he kind of told me that to find forget having my own band and find bands that are working that are so i can make a few dollars at least so i started doing a lot of uh private parties and weddings and things like that but um it was tough for me because i always had this uh part of me that liked writing songs and doing my own thing or play and even when if i would play a cover I would like to change it around. It was just a creative side in me, I guess, being a songwriter. And I and I refused to play a cover identical. I never liked playing a guitar solo uh, the way it was on the record because I always assumed that there was more to offer than just redo the same thing that people are used to hearing. So that was I did that for a few years in in cover bands and as I say playing weddings and things and then I just went back to doing my own thing and it was just a hard road um, but to cut a, a you know uh, make a, a long story short you know it's just a lot of hard work trial and error and uh, sticking true to yourself and don't listen to anybody but yourself and it got me to the states eventually and. Um, I just have a look back and now I've, I've got a, a great career and uh, there's no looking back. I can't I can complain about it. And um, it's just one of these things where you keep learning as long as you are willing to learn um, because and, – and, and I get a lot of young musicians asking me all the time, what's the key to success? How do you do it? How, how can I – how can I – have this passion like you got to make a living out of it. And I, and, uh, and I said, as long as you don't, uh, if, as long as you don't live for the, for the amount of dollars and cents, you know, it, just be happy to get what you can get, especially in the early days, you will get there eventually. 
And if you want to make a lot of money in your life, pick another occupation because um, in the early days, you really don't make a lot of money as a musician. You, you've got to you do it for the love first. And I was able to do that. I never really cared too much about the dollars and cents. And in many ways, I'm still the same. I don't pick up my guitar worrying about how much am I going to make at this concert. Um, I'm more concerned about giving the audience a great show. And that's still the way I am to this very day. I think it's important. We're, 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 we're artists. We're not plumbers or you know or contractors we're artists so i think that the art has to come first how am i to know and how am i to see the road keeps taking me From A to Z, all I really know, time slips away. You had to move from Australia to America. Now, what prompted you to do that? Like, what was the emphasis to do that? Did you see your career in Australia as you needed to further your career elsewhere or you just because America is the home of rock and roll and blues that you just thought, well, that's the place I've got to go to to uh, continue my career? Was that generally how it worked out for you? I, I always wanted to come to the United States. Um, the United States is, is – and that was just something that I knew I wanted to do and needed to do and uh, I'd always bring it up and I remember my mother saying to me all the time, you were born in the wrong country, you know, and uh, because I would say it all the time, I'm going to end up in America. Um, and then one day my management while I was in Australia, because I had a, a really good career and I was you know, keeping myself very active and busy and doing quite well with it. And my management said that we had an opportunity, had an invitation to go and play at uh, Buddy Guy's Legends and um, because Buddy and his management asked me if I'd be interested to play at, at the club at back in, they, I, I believe it was 1989 when the invitation came in. And um, I ended up going there in 1990. But how can you knock a, 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 an invitation like that back? So I, I, I just took it up and uh, said, yeah, this is great. Let's do it. And I came for a two-week tour in, in the States, went back to Australia, and I thought, wow, um, I've pretty much done everything that I've wanted to do in Australia, and I just saw these huge new challenges that I could have, I was willing to approach in the States. It was just like, okay. So I thought, unfinished business, I better get my... Uh, myself back there and I came back uh, for six months and then those six months I decided to extend my visas and I stayed for another six months and then so forth and so forth and 30 years later um, it's home I'm an American citizen you, you just don't know where life takes you and that's what I was trying to say uh, before is just you know you've got to put the craft first and things just fall into place and, and, and but you know at the same time don't expect it to fall into place without working hard you've got to work yeah. hard at it yeah, totally. and 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 prove to yourself and when you can prove to yourself that you have got the ability to do something then the audiences will see that and hear that and and just keep moving forward and uh, it, it worked out for me. Yeah. Because you still have a fan base in Melbourne, I noticed. Um, when you came back to Birds, for instance, I mean, you had a, quite a uh, reasonable amount of people who knew your material. Because uh, i got to admit, I hadn't heard of you uh, before you came to Birds. Um, uh, that's no that's no disrespect to you at all. It was just uh, – oh, I, no. I, I just had no context. Um 
And uh, so, yeah, when when you, when they said, "Oh, he's ex Australian," I'm ex Australian because uh, I, you know, it was just like, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, you know, it was just like, wow, okay, uh, he'd be interesting to talk to because, um, you know, like playing with Buddy Guy is a massive um, achievement because he's one of the blues legends, you know. Last man standing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and, but, uh, and so we, when you went to America, that original in the original time in what was it nineteen ninety ninety one whatever it was, yeah. When you so w- were you touring? Were you going up and down the east coast and west coast and on, all that sort of thing? Or when I first came to the states, it was basically in Chicago and I uh, did Buddy Guy's Legends. And while I was there, I did uh, there was like the Kingston Mines, which is a like the, the biggest tourist attraction for blues. And then there was there's another club just tip, just straight head called Blues, so I hit the blues scene and uh, I was lucky enough to um, while I was there to meet you know uh, people like uh, Junior Wells and I mm. got up on stage and played with the late and great Junior Wells, uh, the Chief Eddie Clearwater, and um, uh, just so many people uh, Jimmy Dawkins and all these great artists. And like I said, in two weeks, my head was just spinning because I was actually on stage with people. All I knew them from was pictures on album covers mm. and I'm standing right next to them on stage. I mean, that's uh, it, it, it makes you shake at the knees. So but when, I went, when I went back to Australia, it was actually it was funny because the flight back from that, that two-week stint that I did in Chicago – I was just, my whole head was still spinning. And it wasn't until I actually got off the plane back in Melbourne and thought, what am I doing here? I've done everything I wanted to do here. So I pretty much bought, you know, another ticket and went back. <laughs> and that was it, without an invitation, without anything, and just and just did it from, um, you know, with, with zero, with nothing, and just kind of built my reputation up and... Uh, it took a, it took a, you know a few years to really uh, make a mark, but it, but it was so exciting and so adventurous that the time just flew by. I, I, I remember uh, calling my mother at one point, and um, she asks me, "Are you ever coming back home?" And I said, "Of course I will. I'll come home." And she goes, "You do realise you've been there seven years." And I had no idea that seven years had passed. And I thought, wow, that's a long time. So I did go back to visit, but uh, but it, it just uh, Chicago had become home. And then um, I was lucky enough to um, get, go on the road with the late and great Jimmy Dawkins. So I, I toured with him for a good you know, year and a half to two years. And uh, the deal with him was that I would open up all his shows and then I would call him out and just back him up for the main show. So we were on the road for a couple of years doing that. So it just it sort of just grew and things. It, it, it's one of these things, you know, that saying you, you just go forward and never look back. And uh, I guess I lived it and I'm still living it. Mm. I mean, you know, playing with Jimmy Dawkins would have been interesting. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't, uh, there's nothing that I can really think about and, and, and say, oh, I wish I didn't do that. I'm just so glad I've done it all. Mm. And, and still, you know, like right now, it's um, um, even Canada mm. has, has become a big thing for me. I've, I've, the last uh, 10 to 12 years, I guess, I've been uh, traveling in and out of Canada twice a year. Also, so it, it just broadens things, you know, and, 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 and it's a whole nother country and a whole nother new audience, mm. which has become part of the American scene for me as well. So, and like you said, you know, I, get, I go to Australia and still have those decent crowds coming out to see me. So, I'd like to hit Europe one day, but the, you know, with Canada and the US and Australia, um, I don't know how to fit. European at this stage, but hopefully one day. I- There'll be always an opening in that Sicilian uh, somewhere in that piazza somewhere for you. I'm sure there would be. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I grew up in, in, a, in a 
an Italian family. That's my it. dad was born in Sicily. Mm. So, and my, my mother was born in Australia, but her parents were born in Sicily, which makes me, you know, pretty much a thoroughbred Sicilian, right? So, so, so your, um, your mother's parents came to Australia in the early 20s, did they? Or Yeah, right after the war. And, and, and my dad, my dad, I, my dad came after the war. Actually, I'm not. I'm not sure how long my um, mother's parents were in Australia, but my dad was one of the first one of the first to come to migrate to Australia after World War Two. And um, my my dad used to play guitar as as, as a hobby. So um, that's how I got onto playing guitar mm. because I used to watch him play, and uh, he just fascinated me. I said, I want to do this. And of course, you know, as I grew up, I mean, I think we all got, well, I, I got influenced by, you know, when, when, when the British invasion, the Beatles and all that, the Stones, um, as a kid saying, that's what I want to do. And, you know, it all grows from that. But, um, but the roots of it all comes from my dad. Uh, I was just like, you know, three, four, five years old watching this guy playing guitar and I just he was my guitar hero in many ways still is story the way that I've grown my childhood was simple but I found it hard when I played my guitar nobody listened to my heart I played those blues so well and nobody heard the tune that's the trade, isn't it? Because apparently your son plays guitar as well. So it's, it's transformed from your father to you, to you, to your son. Is that correct? My son is a musician. He actually lives in Germany now. And um, uh, some of the stuff that I've heard him do um, is just incredible. I mean, I remember he came to visit me and we were doing – I had scheduled to do some television at um, downtown Chicago in JBTV, which is one of uh, a great music uh, station. And my son happened to be there. So I said, come on, come and join me on this. So he just jumped into the band and, and, and started playing my songs. He knew my songs and uh, he just killed it. It was just, I was so impressed and, and at the same time really proud of him. It's, it's just, it's an amazing feeling to see your offspring uh, actually probably doing it better than yourself, you know, and it's, 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 it's an amazing feeling. Well, that's a big rap, better than doing it what your father can do it. Yeah, uh, I, 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 that's how I felt. I, wow. was just, I was just watching him and going, wow, mm. this kid can play, mm. you know. Is he playing professionally so, as well or is, is that his main yeah. thing? I, I, yes, he is. Yep, yep. He's out there in Germany. He he lived in New York for a while, so he did uh, some stuff in New York, and he did his um, his stint uh, across Australia as well. So, uh, so yeah, he's he's he's, he's uh, following his own path mm. and doing his own thing too. You know, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah, exactly, mate. Forging your own path, but you've been you've been in the music industry quite a while yourself, I, right? I have, yes, I have, yes. Actually, I'll take this opportunity to say I'm I'm loving your um, what you're doing right now. Oh, thank you. In your voodoo, <laughs> in your voodoo room here. It's 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 um, I've been watching this from your first episode. Oh wow! And uh, it's 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 great. I mean, we became friends at the um, birds. At birds. Yeah. And um, I was impressed with the, with your mixing because mm. you mixed me that night. Yeah. And it was a comf comfortable night because that's the most important thing for any artist is have a good mix on stage. Yeah. And you gave me that. Yeah. So uh, 
Um, yeah, so I was really looking forward to working with you again. Yeah, but totally. I didn't think we'd be talking on uh, on the internet this way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I was looking forward to it as well. I mean, uh, I heard rumours that you were coming up. But see, when we stopped uh, in March, uh, we were having a whole lot of ra- – we had a lot of problems. We, were, we weren't we were sure how many, week, how many days a week we were going to be working. We had the bushfires and then COVID came in. The world was a bit of a spin, I've got to tell you, around um, late March. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, you lived in Nashville. What brought you there? Uh, yeah, I, was, I started out in Chicago, and I believe I was here probably, I don't know, seven, eight years. And I always wanted to check out Nashville. So um, I, I had a... I moved, I had a studio, I shut it down and everything and uh, moved to Nashville. And I stayed there, I believe, was about I don't know, 18 months, 15 months. And it was a great experience because it's just completely different to Chicago, nothing like Chicago. And uh, But I always wanted to do that. But I've got this soft spot for Chicago. So I, after I did my stint in Nashville, I thought, that was fun. This is good. And uh, packed up all my stuff again and, and went back to Chicago and I've been here ever since. I just, I love Chicago. It's a great city for me, uh, for a big city, for a huge city, one of the biggest cities in the world. It's, uh, for me, it's the best city in the world. I just love Chicago. There's something about it. There's a, there's a, a magical feel about it. Why is that? What 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 do you think the magic is in Chicago? I think the magic is the history. Um, mu- the music history is amazing. You know, the, especially the, the the blues scene. It's just it's the capital of the blues, and um, and I, I guess for me, I only can speak for me. I guess I've got a soft spot because that's where I was first introduced in the United States. Was in Chicago. Chicago, and I couldn't have got. I had the red carpet, you know, getting invited out and playing at uh, Buddy Guy's Legends. And my first time on stage in the United States was with Mr. Guy. I mean, y- you're talking royalty here. So it's like, I guess I, I, I grew to have a soft spot for Chicago. And every time I play Legends, I, I kind of get a, a, a little emotional just being at Legends and. Uh, it, it was the start of my career in the United States, so it's it, it's home for me. So when you're my musical home. So when you're when you're on the tour bus, um, are you traveling from Chicago, say for instance, to Canada on a bus, or you're flying there? What what do you usually do? <laughs> no, we we travel by road um, because I I like using all my own gear. I like um, I don't like just going to a, a venue and 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 picking up an amplifier that's, that's sitting, as you know, as you found out, I like to bring my own gear in and everything. So I we travel with all our equipment. And uh, so, you know, we all become, uh, you know, my band and my crew, we're just like a family. We spend, I spend more time on the road than at home. So the road is home yeah. until this COVID hit. Mm. Um so it's uh, it's an interesting life. I've never I've done it most of my life. I was doing that in Australia too, you know, just travelling around and uh, going, you know, from state to state. I used to do a lot of television promotional things in Australia too, going all over the place, uh, from Sydney to to Melbourne and to Canberra. Um, just just travelling all the smaller towns like Shepparton and. And Mildura, yeah, and all those places, you know, yeah, all these places. I mean, I'd go, I'm the same here. I'll go anywhere where they want to hear me and I don't say no to anything, Pete. You just do it. You just do it, that's it. Yeah. No, well, that's the only way you can do it. You just got to do it. And, uh, you you know, I mean, we're a bit spoiled now, I think, with the tours because um, you tend to fly, you get accommodation, you do the gig and then you fly out again. You know, it's not like, I mean, the the old days when you used to get in the back of a truck and 
have everything in there, all your PA and your lights and the road crew and the band are in one car and you're all going into the one direction up north somewhere and you're playing all these local country clubs and all that sort of thing. Um, that sort of hard yards still exist to a certain degree, but it's more formalised now than what it ever was, you know? Well, it's to, to, to an extent depends. You know, some people just uh, like to go there and use the back line that's at, at, at the venues and stuff because most of the big venues have got back lines and things. But I still like to do it the old school way, have my, just as you described, you know, when you, you know, our gears in a, in a big cargo trailer with the minibus hauling and uh, um, I'm doing it the way I know how. That's it. If that makes yeah, any I, I sense get it. to you. I, and that's the it. only way to do it. And, and that way, uh, especially when you're playing smaller, smaller, let's call them towns, you know, little townships and little venues that haven't got the back lines and haven't got the, the great PA systems and things, you know. We arrive there, we check it out and say, okay, I'm not going to work with that. And we just set up the stage with the, with, the, with the right PA system and the right back line and, and just... And, and, and just leave people in awe. People are like, wow, mm. what just hit here? Yeah. What tornado was this? <laughs> but that's the way it's <laughs> but that's the way it's done. I mean, I, I had I mean, I everywhere we travel, I'm known as and every, I'll, I'll go to venues and they'll say, Here comes the band with all the gear. And I'm known that's 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 what they call me, the guy with all the gear. But you know, it's not because we're uh, to impress anything, I've got a sound that I want to That's create. It. I've got certain ways of doing my show. Mm. So uh, the back line just isn't quite enough sometimes. Yeah, totally. I mean, and that's fair enough because I know what you mean. You can go to these uh, – uh, ta- I mean, I've done tours up in the, the northern part of uh, Queensland and uh, it's through Premier, which you probably know of, you know, Premier Artists mm-hmm. in Melbourne. And, uh, yes. Um, I remember we went to uh, Toowoomba. Uh, or some place like that, and that's really redneck sort of hillbilly area, you know. And uh, we, I thought it was a a reputable pub because all the reputable A grade musicians were playing there, and it was a cafe, and it was just <laughs> it was just a side, you know, a, a small stage with two RCFs on either side of the stage, and that was it. But they were getting reputable artists playing in there, you know, and uh, and they just didn't have much in terms of a mi- mixing desk. I think it was a four-channel, just enough for four vocal mics, and that was it. But what they relied on was more their um, relationship with Premier and, and their relationship with the community, and people didn't really fuss too much about the quality. You know, they weren't going there to see – you know, it's not, a, it's not a concert hall. They knew exactly what they were getting, and I think sometimes you've got to put it into perspective, and that's what it taught me when I was touring in those sort of places, you know. Well, it's it's important to to play for the venue too. It's like if you when you're on the road, especially when you're you're travelling uh, as much as I do, you throughout the year, like when you start a new year, you're going to obviously hit a lot of these same venues again for the new year. But at the, in the middle of all that, you get all these new places you've never been at. So what happens there is sometimes you'll approach a place and you'll you'll walk into the venue and go, uh-oh, how am I going to fit all my gear in here? So you've got to play for the venue. So I will play down to it. I'll, I'll say, okay, let's use or let's not use this and let's 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 do an unplug show. And, and those things there just blow people's minds too. Yeah. You don't always have to be full-blown. Yeah. So you've got to play for the venue. It's ridiculous if you're going to put all that gear into a venue and take up all the space, and there's only enough room for ten people. Oh yeah, <laughs> so you know, that's right. You're gonna, yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm yeah, saying. Oh, yes. So, um, so for me, when I when I do tour Australia these days, that's the only thing that I kind of miss a lot is that I haven't got all my own gear, but I have got um, an amplifier that has been built for me that stays in Australia. And I do bring my own guitars from the States. So at least I, I'm comfortable in that respect. And um, what, what, what guitars do you use? 
What's your favourite guitar? When I'm on the road doing my show, I actually bring a vault with me. It's full of guitars. I'm, I've usually got like um, three Stratocasters in there that are completely different from one another. I use a PRS. I use Ovations for acoustic and also play Taylor, mm. uh, the semi-acoustic Taylor. How, how, have you, and, how, um, how have you found the Taylor? Because I recorded a Native American guy um, who had a Taylor – guitar and it was very temperamental is yours temperamental in terms of like the humidity factor um the humidity yes yeah. but i had it modified and now it gives me no problems at all okay. i mean when i first bought it it was like what the hell's going on here it's just <laughs> I, I i if the humidity would get i picked it up one night yeah. on stage and the strings were just flat on the neck just lying flat like that couldn't play it. It was just sitting on – and I said, what happened here? So I took it to my Luther and he did some modifications to it. And apparently the, what he does is he puts shims in between the neck and the body and those shims will keep it – will stop it from doing that. And, and I'll tell you, man, since he did that to it, it, it stays in tune. Unless I change the strings, it never goes out of tune and it doesn't budge. It's just a great guitar. And how does it compare to a Strat? Well, Stratocasters, you know, they're great. They're, they're, they're rugged. You can throw them on the ground, pick it up and still play it. I mean, a Stratocaster would just it's, – it's, it's, it's a workhorse, you know, and I love them. I've, I've got uh, – ooh, lost track. I think four Stratocasters that I use, and um, they're just workhorses. I mean, they're not delicate. They're not – as I said, you can drop them, you can hit them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. They just keep going, you know. Um, if, if you bend the string too hard and it goes a little out of tune, just bend it again. It goes back in tune. I mean, they're great guitars. I mean, I, I was born and raised on a Stratocaster. Mm. I still got the, the original Strat that my dad bought me. Um, uh, sixty-eight, I believe it's a nineteen sixty-eight model, and um, that's still my favourite guitar. I haven't had a, a better guitar than that ever. It's fantastic. Um, I'm, I prefer the Strat than a Telecaster because the Telecaster is more – it's got too much twang on the the, the Telecaster, I find, you know, that, that sound, which I don't really gravitate to. I prefer the Strat sound. Well, the Telecaster is really cool for, um, you know, like um, country, country, yeah. country music. It's just got that twang to it, yeah. which is great. But the Stratocaster is, is more versatile. You can play any – you can play jazz on it, you can play country on it, you can play rock on it, um, you can play metal on it if you want. It's just such a versatile guitar. It, uh, it just makes it's, – it's a magical instrument. It is. So I just want to touch on your recording studios because I'm really intrigued by it because you've set up a couple studios over your career. Um, was it initially to try and make it a uh, – make the studios like a um, a profitable part of your career, like to actually bring bands in, record them and do the whole production side of things or was it just purely for your own purposes? Uh, purely for my own purposes. The very first studio I recorded, um, I recorded it because um, in, in Australia I worked for years and years and I still work with, with Greg Williams at Dex Audio. Yeah. We, we, still, we still work together over the internet and everything. Um, just, it's just a, together we just we create magic. Isn't the, I'll use that word again. It's just magical working with Greg. But when I moved to the States, uh, I did two albums and totally on my own without Greg. And the first album that I did was called My Shadow and I recorded it in Soto Sound, which is a studio where Buddy Guy recorded, um, I think, three albums there and Junior Wells and Eddie Clearwater. All these major blues artists worked at Soto Sound. Um, but I wasn't uh, in Chicago very long when I started recording my first album there. So you know, the... It cost me a, a fortune. So I thought, geez, the money I'm spending to make this album, I could buy my own equipment and probably cost me half the price or, you know, and then I can keep using that equipment and, and keep creating music. So that's how I, that's how the idea of building a studio came. And then 
as time passed, um, again, you know, I'm a struggling musician in the early days in the States and I thought, well, I've got this studio, why don't I record some people and, uh, and try and support my habit, which is my career, try and support my habit uh, making music for other people and produce some albums for others. So I, I did that for a while, but then as my career grew again, um, the studios just all ended up. I've built uh, four studios in, in America, and um, but they're all built for my own. Because once you start doing your own productions and everything, it's really hard to go into another studio and just watch somebody else do it. It becomes a habit to do it yourself. And um, when I work with Greg now, I do all my own recordings and everything, and then I get then it's, I send him the masters, and he will do all the all the mastering and, and all that, and uh, so I can get away fr from it and um, get a fresh set of ears on it. And that's how my albums come um, complete now, and, and Greg's still involved in my productions. Well, I watched your documentary, and I was really in pleased to see that uh, when you were playing with Buddy Guy, um, he had some African-American women doing the backing vocals. And then did you tour with some of the women who... Brenda, yeah. Brenda, the, the gal that's on the documentary, she actually toured with me for, um, ooh, it's got to be eight, nine years. She toured, She actually came to Australia with me twice. I mean, she's makes you... Doing my best. No, no disrespect again, but uh, I find when she sings with you, your music just lifts another 20%, 30%. Of course yeah. it does. Yeah, because you... Um, uh, it, it gives it another dimension. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had up to like nine piece bands behind me. Uh, these days, um, I travel lightly. Just a, it's a trio: me, a drummer, and a bass player. It's just the stages I go through. But I'm enjoying playing the trio thing right now because it, it, you really have to work hard, and it, 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 it's, it's a challenge to your chops. Mm. You know, as you as you notice when we're, we're birds, pretty much. You know, I, I had. A rhythm player that night because he's a good friend of mine. He I used to, he was one of my students when I was living in Australia. Wow. I said, "Come on, do these few gigs with me." So he kind of just jumped up there. And uh, but normally it's uh, the trio thing these days. Just the power pop, power power blues. Yeah, man. Just yeah. say it the way it is, it. right? <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult to forge a career in music coming from an Italian background in Australia? I grew up in this environment. Number one, it was an Italian family. Number two, my dad was a self-made man. So it, it was drummed in my head to just survive and, and do your own thing. But the, the toughest thing for me was that I broke away from all that because I wanted to be a musician. And my dad would say to me in, in, in the early days, he supported me all the way, but the, when, I, when I was younger and he'd say, and I'd say, I'm going to be a musician, he'd say to me, uh, I don't know about that, man, because there's, there's, there's no one in our family that's ever done it and there's no, you know, you've got no role model here. Um, you're going into, into a territory you know nothing about. So that was a tough thing. But he eventually saw that that's where I wanted to go. So he supported me, said, you know, it really doesn't matter. Just treat it as a business and uh, it'll probably work out for you and, and you should be okay. But the rest of the family thought, I used to hear things about, you know, oh, he's lost his mind, he's, he's crazy, where's he going with this, you know? There's, there's no future in, in being a musician. And so that was the toughest thing. And I'm sure you can probably relate to some of that thing that I'm talking to you about because they don't get it, right? Um, but there's not much to get because what I realised was a job's a job. And if you do a job properly, you will be successful with it. And whether, whether you're a musician or whether you're going to sweep the streets, if you don't do that job properly, um, it's not going to work out. So I decided at a very young age, I'm going to do this. And I, when I say young age, I would, would have been 
maybe seven, eight, nine years old, I knew this is what I was going to do. And um, I find that to be a very lucky thing because in this business to succeed, you do have to start very, very young because the older you get, the harder it is because it takes a long time uh, to get anywhere with it. Well, it's been great talking with you, Michael. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Pete. It was great to meet you yeah, again, that's it. I should say, that's and uh, talk to you. And uh, looks like this year's a wash, but hopefully I'll see you next year. Yeah, mate. let's hope so, eh? You stay safe, my yeah, brother. thank you, mate. Love the idea 